I'm Matt Doran. This is the shocking story of how a faulty justice system released two career criminals, allowing them to go on a rape and murder spree, how they were caught and how that same justice system finally sent them into a very long, cold incarceration. This is an electronically recorded interview between Detective Sergeant Mark Winterflat and Lindsay Hawani Beckett. Get him, mate. Get him. Get him. Get him. Shut up, you little bitch. He told me to tie her up at the beginning. Right. And then I tied her up to a tree. Right. And, um... Get here. In the car. Get in. Get in. Get in. And Liz told me what to do. What was that? We won't say anything. We just want to go, please. Tell me to cut, cut her throat. This is the spectacular Sapphire Coast in the far south of New South Wales. The Pacific Ocean rolls onto golden surfing beaches, sweeping bays and rocky headlands. They are part of a line of national parks and waterways that stretch down the coast to the Victorian border. And although some parts of this coast are ravaged by bushfires, it remains a favoured destination for holidaymakers. The northern gateway to this natural paradise is the town of Bega, some 430 kilometres from Sydney and famous for its dairy products. It's also known as a safe place for children to grow up, far from big city dangers. It's the New South Wales Labor Day long weekend, 1997, in the October school holidays. A group of Bega High School students is taking part in a weekend camp out in bushland near their homes in the village of Kalaroo, south of the town. Among them are Nicole Collins, aged 16, and her friend, Lauren Barry, who's about to have her 15th birthday. The girls have been close friends for several years part of a group that includes teenagers Rebecca Kemble and Sarah Darcy. We always had fun things to do. Both Nicole and I and Rebecca all had horses, so we spent most of our weekends riding together. Nicole, <laughs> she was pretty, she was very outgoing, very friendly, engaging, not at all shy. She was very vivacious. She always had lots of energy. So if you're ever feeling down in the dumps or not in a mood to, to maybe go for a, a ride or go and see some friends. She's always had the ability to make you feel more happy and energised to go and do it kind of thing. There, she was just full of life and full of energy and she was always doing things, always on the go. Lauren um, was not, she was much more low key. Lauren was very much a homebody. She loved being at home with mum and dad and her brother. She was calm and very sweet and kind and generous and she was a lot of fun. My sister, when we grew up, uh, a lot of the properties that we lived on, there wasn't too many kids nearby some of the, most of the time, so she was my best mate as well as my sister. You know, just like any sister, you know, a brother and sister, we fought like cat and dog. We had, you know, we'd finish fighting and having an argument and then there'd be this deep, unconditional love for each other. Hey, so how's horse riding on the weekend? It was really good. I did this really big job. Even though the teenagers are responsible and trustworthy, their parents still make sure the camp out is well supervised. <laughs> Nicole's parents would come up and check on us and so would 
Lauren's parents so they could easily access to where, where we were staying. Yeah, I tried horse riding once, fell off. <laughs> It was just an area where the, the two girls and their friends would go to a lot of holidays. They'd take their horses and, and set up a bit of a camp and they'd just have a peaceful area overlooking the ocean. I can't believe we have to go back to school soon. Oh, I know. I don't want to go back to school. On Sunday night, being a long weekend, the group stays up late. Oh, I got up and put something in the bin and then she put me on detention for like four days. Are you serious? <laughs> so oh my god. Slight. And we were just sitting around the campfire, um, talking, listening to music. And then Nicole was actually, had, had been a bit upset because she broke up with her boyfriend. I wonder where he is. Don't worry, your boyfriend will be here. It's been ages. Seriously, he's probably on his way, don't worry. It's been hours. Yeah, it's probably on his way or something, don't worry. So... Nicole decided that she was going to walk to Chilla and talk to her ex and see if they could work things out. Hey, I know where he's staying. Do you want to walk up? You sure? Yeah, come on, let's go. He's just yeah. in his auntie. So, wait, where are you going? We walked everywhere. I mean, we were only 16. We didn't have cars. We didn't, have, we didn't even have bicycles. We had the horses and we had our feet. So, to get around in Calaroo, that's what we did. We walked. Where are you guys going? We're just going to town, we'll be back soon. Nicole decided that she was going to walk and then Lauren decided that she was going to go with her. Eventually, the girls reach the main road and head towards Jilla. Although it's several kilometres, they fully intend to walk all the way. Young teenagers that grow up here, it's a very carefree place. There's a high level of trust. There are no great risks. But people have got to understand it's not a busy uh, suburb in Sydney. It is, in fact, a very remote area. And they were actually only a short distance from their home. They were camping. Their parents knew where they were. And they were going to another friend's place for a small party. It was easy walking distance. They knew the way well. I came back at about 10 past 10, I think it was, in the evening, and uh, the girls weren't at camp. Next morning, Lauren's brother, Nathan, is one of the first campers to wake up. I think I, I left the camp that morning, would have gone back to the house, I guess from memory, the first thing I would have said was, um, you know, have you seen the girls? Have the girls been down here? And um, straight away, my parents said, no, 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 they're supposed to be with you. While Lauren's mother, Cheryl, starts ringing around, Lauren's father, Garrett, goes straight to the campsite. said, where's Lauren? And I said, oh, she and Nicole have walked out to Jilla. I said, they're probably at Nicole's house. They weren't anywhere we expected them to be. And there was a very small chance that both of them were injured had got somehow fallen over and broken their legs in the night time. Nicole's father, Graham, drives out past the campsite towards the ocean, where he searches along the cliff tops. We rode through all the trails um, between Tartha and Kalaroo. There's a lot of them. So we went through and we were calling out to them because we thought if they're hurt, they'll, you know, call back. By midday, with no sign of the girls, the families decide it's time to call the police. Shut up! They can't know that the girls have already undergone a long and terrible ordeal and are far, far away. Stop your snivelling!
I know he's seen. Can you have a look? Are you sure? Yeah, come on. Okay, so, okay, where he's going? We're going to go into town. See you later. Oh, bye. Teenagers Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins have walked away from a campsite on Sunday night on the October long weekend in 1997. On the Monday morning, while the first frantic searches are taking place, a council worker finds a large pink coloured television set on the road near the girls' campsite. He loads it onto his truck and it'll be several weeks before it's recognised as a vital clue. Meanwhile, bigger detectives quickly establish the girls are not simply runaways. When you met their parents and sort of talked through the, the type of children they were, they would maintain constant contact, almost for no reason, in the middle of parties. The families were adamant that their girls hadn't run away, that's not in their makeup, they've never done it before. The girls, aged 15 and 16, disappeared from a campsite near Bigger after telling friends they were going for a walk. The search for the girls expands as SES and other local volunteers begin detailed sweeps of the bushland. The whole community, everybody, came down and said, we're here to help, you know, we'll, we'll help you search. The first thing I, I did was to try and drive to all the places where the girl, I thought the girls could have been. Houses, um, hangouts, places in the bush where we used to all go, you know, cubby houses and our favourite spots, and the girls were, weren't any of them, so then started driving the highways, you know, and be looking out for anything along the side of the road, north, south, east, west. There's been no contact from the teenagers or any confirmed sighting. The council worker dumps the TV set at the local refuse centre. It will be found a few hours later by a scavenger who takes it home, repaints it black and sells it to a local hotel. The main search parties are now joined by mounted police and the dog squad. And Lauren's father, Garrett, is out with them every waking moment. I can remember him just being helpless in this sort of rage, but sort of uncontrollable uh, pain going through him. And um, that's what makes me upset now, because I get it, what he was feeling at the time. And, uh, and he just took off. Well, as you don't know me, my name's Garrett Barry. I'm the father of the girls. And, um, thank you all for coming, OK? Really appreciate it. No sleep whatsoever. I've never seen anything like it to try and find them. While the searches are going on, a local resident finds some abandoned clothes on a dirt road not far from the camp. There's a girl's top and a distinctive Czech flannelette shirt. They are soon recognised as Lauren Barry's and the police return them to her mother. A distraught Cheryl carefully puts the clothes away, unaware they carry vital DNA evidence. We didn't put two and two together at that time because, as, a, as I say, the girls were just missing at that stage. It was just the first day that they'd been missing. By Wednesday, Detective Shane Box gets more evidence that the girls have not run away. Checks have revealed they haven't accessed their bank accounts or taken any personal items from home. Um, I, I briefed my senior officers in, uh, in Wollongong at Region and at Batemans Bay and just said, listen, there's more to it than this. Something's not right here. And as a result, the task force investigation commenced and uh, we went from there. The media is running with the story and the families make an emotional plea for help. They're enduring almost unbelievable suffering. <laughs> Two sets of parents tortured by the disappearance of their teenage daughters pleading for help. The pain I'm going through and not knowing where she is is unbelievable. Having fun, and she just said, See you tomorrow. At half past ten, we were going to pick her. <laughs> she was.
the publicity generates a rush of information. A local mother comes forward to report she was driving to Tarthra at 9.50pm on the Sunday night when she came across a car stopped on the highway. Unable to pass safely, she had to stop and in the light of her headlights she can see two girls and a man standing by the car. There's enough light for her to give police a clear description of him. The car finally moved over and the mother was able to overtake it safely and continue on her way. Another witness comes forward to say he saw a pink TV set abandoned on the roadside. It's just one of hundreds of small pieces of information offered by deeply concerned locals. It was all people talked about. You know, you walk down the street and everybody seemed to know them or their parents or their siblings or, you know, their kids went to school with them or, you know, it was, it was just what everybody talked about. I recall that turning up to the family's homes, there were people leaving the homes after dropping off some food for them. They were, they were there to offer them support. In the nine days since their daughter's disappearance, they've only had hope to cling to. Of just every day, um, you know, we would have big groups of people at our house. Mum would make heaps of food for everyone and we would all talk about what's happened so far and what we're going to do next. A few days into it, we'd searched all the areas we could. Um, we had to scale back the search. We expanded it to many kilometres, a uh, kilometre radius of the campsite. But then we had to make a decision to scale back the search and we did. Most of the team returned to their stations, be it um, Nara, Wollongong and other places. And it left, uh, I think, four detectives here to investigate it. It's now almost a month since the disappearance. But just as the task force investigation is wound down, new information suddenly surfaces about a pair of violent career criminals, Leslie Camilleri and Lindsay Beckett. And it was just information from the police at Yass that you should look at these two blokes. They're into the badness, uh, they're into sexual assaults, and they may fit the criteria. Lindsay Hawani Beckett is a New Zealander with a low intelligence who, at age 24, has multiple convictions for robbery and assault. Leslie Alfred Camilleri is a dangerous psychopath who, since the age of 12, has racked up an amazing 146 criminal convictions. Police in Bega, trying to solve the mystery of missing teenagers Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins, are told about two violent career criminals, Leslie Camilleri and Lindsay Beckett. The two men have been living in Yass in southern New South Wales. An informant tells local police, who advise the Bega detectives. The informant had noticed something in the newspaper, was aware of an article in the newspaper about the two missing schoolgirls. And there'd been a conversation between Beck and Camilleri to the effect that I bet the police try and blame this on us. And they'd arced up about it quite badly. And that seemed odd to this informant who also knew that Beck and Camilleri were in Bega. They check the background of the two and find Camilleri has recently faced court on six counts of the violent rape of an 11-year-old girl, but was freed after his trial was aborted on a legal technicality. He and Beckett are also on bail awaiting trial for the abduction and multiple rape of a 19-year-old woman. The detectives then get a call from Canberra Police 
with the news they've arrested Beckett after chasing a stolen car. And in the vehicle that he was driving was some bloodstained clothing in the boot. Let's go and introduce ourselves. Let's have a look at this clothing. Who knows, it could be the girl's clothing or something we can identify. Detective Winter Flood drives to Canberra with Detective Stuart Gray. On the way, Gray is preparing for the Beckett interview by reading through various witness statements. He rereads the witness report of an abandoned pink TV set near where the girls disappeared. So I was travelling with this detective and he said, you know, it would make sense if you had a pink TV in, or a large TV in the car that to get two girls in, you'd put a TV out and you'd put it beside the road. And I remember thinking, well, listen, that's just, you know, that's neither here nor there. It's really a bit of a nothing. So I sort of didn't give it a lot of credence. As I explained to you earlier today... When they interview Beckett, they find him arrogant and deliberately nonchalant. And towards the end of the interview, I put into him, uh, put to him, uh, and did you have this, a pink TV in your car? Well, the feet, you know, snapped down and he sat up and obviously I'd sort of, I'd hit a sore point with him. Uh, he didn't tell us much about it, but we just registered there's something about this television that's important. Beckett then admits to having a television set in the car in Bega, but he says he can't remember what happened to it. But I wish to speak to you further about it. So we started to work on the theory that maybe the TV was put out to put people in. So we thanked him for his time and, and we left. And we went from there to Yass to try and meet the informant. In Yass, the detectives discover that Camilleri and Beckett had actually stolen a pink TV set from the informant. And the, the main relevance of that television, he'd actually put Beckett and Camilleri um, at that scene. Oh, mate, mate, in the back seat, go to the TV, dump on the ground. Go, go, shut up, you bitches! Now, at this point in time, not only is Beckett still in custody in the ACT, but Camilleri had been arrested for some other unrelated matters and was in custody in Goulburn. Camilleri is interviewed in Goulburn jail, but as soon as the subject of the pink TV set is raised, he refuses to answer any more questions. Camilleri returns to his prison cell, where he's later reported to be in a distressed state, crying and banging his head against a wall. So we were in a situation where we knew that both of them were in custody, couldn't speak to each other, and this was a golden opportunity to work on their ability not to contact each other and their loyalty. The, uh, the detectives then subject Beckett to a second interview where they tell him they can now link him to the girl's disappearance. And I also had on his uh, on the interview table in front of him, photographs of the two girls, which I'd opened up, and they were large sort of A4 uh, facial photographs of the girls from high school. And he instantly turned them over, and I knew I'd sort of hit a raw spot. Beckett asks to take a break, and while smoking outside, he suddenly bursts into tears and blurts out to his guards, they've got us. So they've marched him back into the room, and he said, oh, give me a map, show me a map, I'll show you where they are. And I went, oh, OK. So we've opened this map on the floor <clears throat> and he started sort of looking at the Manara Highway and Bombala and then he said, they're here, they're back there. Realising his court, Beckett now gives a detailed confession, beginning with how he and Camilleri inject each other with illegal drugs as they drive from Bega to Tarthra. Liz was driving the car and we were going to the beach because I hadn't been to the beach for ages and we were going to go there for a drink yeah. and just see if there's any parties. And um, we were going up the hill and seeing these two girls there and Les, Les stopped. Hey mate, hey, what have we got here? <laughs> hey girls! I asked them if they wanted a lift. So 
and they said, oh yeah, all right then. And then um, we said we're going, going to the beach and asked them if they wanted to come. And they said, yeah. The girls' families and friends are adamant that neither would have willingly got into a car with strangers, insisting they must have been forcibly abducted. You want a lift? We'll give you a lift, huh? No, I'll just walk. There were certainly no signs of violence uh, going on, and it appeared that the girls were actually talking to the vehicle occupants, and one of them was actually out of the car, according to the witness. So at that point, uh, although maybe not a normal uh, or believed uh, action of the girls, certainly on this occasion I think that that, that account is correct. They wouldn't have gotten in the, in the car with, especially a car that looked like the way it did, um, it was all banged up and dodgy looking. Uh, these two were off their faces on drugs. And Nicole and I were both, oh God, you know, we'll, oh, we'll never get in a car with strangers. And she said to me, I'll just never do that. No, I'd never hitchhike, I'd never do anything. You know, Dad would kill me. I'm still to this day convinced that they never hopped in the car voluntarily. They were either coerced into the car or through their mannerisms of Camilleri and Beckett, they were frightened and hopped in the vehicle. Beckett's version of events, he was accurate and, and truthful about a lot of other details. I didn't see him gaining anything by saying they didn't get in voluntarily. Well, I think he lied about it to try and make it sound as though... Party on the beach? No, we can't. We're just going you to know, to make sure. it sound less no, harsh on, on themselves. No. No. Shut up, you little bitch! Mate, 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 get the TV out of the back seat, mate. Dumb on the ground. Go, go! Shut up, you friend, Hey, 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 hey. You with me? Shut up! With me? Get here! In the car! Get, get in! Get in! Shut up! Stay in! In his confession, Beckett claims they drove with the girls the five kilometres to the Tathra Beach Surf Club, where they talked together while he and Camilleri drank a few beers. As the town was quiet, he claims they then decided to drive back to Bega and agreed they would stop on the way at the campsite so the girls could tell the others what they were doing. They've travelled on a uh, dirt road uh, towards this campsite area and it's uh, during that, that travel where um, I would describe it as a four-wheel drive track mainly, um, that Camilleri is driving his two-wheel drive car and uh, it's sustained some sort of damage or at the very least uh, been knocked around a bit. He's become aggressive and produced a knife. And he freaked out and as he was saying, he was saying, um, he was saying, what the fuck are you doing? What, what are you fucking doing? And he was just freaked right out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, he was going, going, pointing his head to, to stop them from hopping out. The doors are shut, you can't get out. If they try to get out, stab him. We'll stab you, both of you. Mate, the girls now out. are captive in the back seat. Shut your mouth, bitch. The two back doors were uh, not functioning correctly. Uh, the interior locks or door handles would not allow either of the doors to open. In terms of your relationship with these girls at that time, can you describe that to me? Well, are they under some duress? Are they happy? Are they friendly? They're under some duress. Shut up! Right. Explain that to me. Um, they knew, they knew, well, let's put a hard word on so if they stop up, you'll kill them. Camilleri turns the car around and heads back to the main road. Stop your bloody whinging! You're bickering and you're snivelling! So they've come back out on the Snowy Mountains Highway, uh, travelled into Kalaroo, and then halfway through Kalaroo, this little township, there's a road to your left which goes past the tip and then comes out on Sapphire Coast Drive. Hey, mate. 
I got a bit of fun with these two girls. <laughs> yeah, you'll be right, girls. Don't worry. You'll be fine. <laughs> So we came along there. Um, yeah, he's a yes, do you mind if we have sex with you? And um, that's it now. And um, so then we kept going, kept driving. So they've driven him out along there, and about halfway between there and the next road. They stopped and they've raped one of them each. The men then head for the Princess Highway and drive south with their captives towards Eden. Throughout the night ahead, they'll maintain their drug highs with booster injections. Camilleri continues to sexually assault them in the back seat. And uh, they were travelling down there and as, as a result uh, of, of Camilleri's want to uh, rape one of the other girls. Um, or use, I guess I use the term swap girls. Um, they pulled into the side of a road uh, at the Ben Boyd National Park, just north of Eden, uh, where again, both girls were raped by each offender. The men now drive into Eden, where Beckett had once worked on a fishing trawler. down to the wharf um, and uh, had a look to see whether the boat that he once worked on was there. During uh, the driving through Eden itself, the girls were told to keep their heads down and uh, as a result, after not finding the boat and uh, Beckett's uh, supposed knowledge of the area, uh, they attempted to try and find a, a back road out of Eden became sort of disorientated and uh, ended up on some dirt tracks again, which um, at that point they stopped the vehicle and, uh, and then raped the girls again. Beckett describes how he drove further south towards the Victorian border. The detectives have little doubt that the girls by now must have had a strong suspicion of the awful destiny awaiting them. Criminal Lindsay Beckett has broken down and is confessing to the abduction of Bega schoolgirls Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins. Shut up! He tells detectives how he and his Shut associate, Leslie Camilleri, drove south Shut towards up. the Victorian border while subjecting their captives to repeated rapes and sexual assaults. As they drive, the men inject each other with more doses of amphetamines. Eventually, Camilleri falls asleep. All right, mate. Just cross the border into Victoria. Victoria? You stupid prick! Sydney! I want to go to Sydney. Turn around! It appears that neither of them really know where they are. Camilleri gets quite angry about that. <laughs> And uh, at this point, Beckett again turned off the main, uh, which was now the Princess Highway at that point in Victoria. Les told me to stop because he wanted to have sex with um, the one with dark hair. Right. 
in this West Wingan area where um, travel down again a dirt road. You get out! Get out! And me and the one with glasses um, kept driving down the road. Bugger off! Come back in 20! Come here, mate! Come on! Come on! Camilleri left the vehicle with Lauren Barry and raped her in some bushes. After that rape, um, it was expressed between Beckett and uh, Camilleri that uh, they used the words, can't go back. And uh, that was expressed by Camilleri and Beckett understood that, that, that realistically that uh, the girls would not be able to be released. As dawn breaks, they are still driving south along the Prince's Highway. They are about 60 kilometres into Victoria when they come to the Can River. They see a sign marking the turn-off to the Monero Highway, back towards Bombala in southern New South Wales, and decide it's time to head north. After about 40 kilometres, they come to a place called Fiddler's Green Creek. Beckett then spots a small side track into the bush. He said to uh, Camilleri, what about this? And uh, Camilleri has said, well, let's have a look, and they've travelled up there. It's just after 7am. Hey, mate. Here, here. It's good. It's good. Both men are now carrying knives. Get her out. Come on, get her out. Get up, get up, get up. Stop your engine, you tie her up, tie her up. Get out. Get out. Stop crying. Stay still. Hold still, hold still. Hold still. Take it out there. Come on, stop walking. Come on, up, little bitch. Stop your window! Stop your trying, we're going nowhere, having a bit of fun. And uh, they're stopped and uh, traversed through very heavy bushland. Don't you ever beat you little bitch? Get out! Keep walking. Are you gonna kill us? We're just taking you down to the creek. Shut your mouth! I'll shut it for you down a, uh, an embankment to a river area of about some 250 metres. Get down to the water's edge. Turn around. Right, untie her. When they reach a creek, Camilleri unties them before ordering them to strip and wash themselves thoroughly to remove all evidence of the rapes. It's not too cold, you little bitch. Get in there and have a wash. Get in there, quick. Get in. Get in there. Go on. Come on. That's it. Get in there. Down there. You know what I mean. And here too. Stop your crying. Just get Stop Come your on. moaning. Come on. Clean yourself up. Hurry up. <laughs> yeah, under your arms. Come on. You too. Come on. Stop you your Clean yourself up. Come on. <laughs> All right, you two. Get out. Get Come dressed. On. Come on. Put it on. Get it on there. They are then told to dress themselves before being gagged. And then um, we took the, tied the girls up, tied their hands up, stings around their mouth so they wouldn't yell. What sort of things? Um, just to stop them from yelling, just um, some of their jeans. Alrighty, take her this way. Go. Go. Lauren is hog-tied face down on the ground and Nicole is tied to a tree a short distance away. Yeah, mate, yeah. He told me to tie her up at me. Mm. And then I tied her up to a tree. Mm. And, um, and Les told me what to do. Mate, you got to kill him. Nah, no, I don't want to kill him. You, you don't understand. you got to kill him. You can take care of him. No, you don't kill him. him, I'll kill you. You got it? Kill him. Yeah, he said drag her over to the water and drown her. Come here. So Beckett goes down to Lauren, drags her into the water, 
he actually held her under the water uh, and he described her as struggling and kicking water in his face. And the other one, she was jumping around and, and um, so, I had to, so I had to try to stab her. And then he stabbed her in the neck at the same time and held her under the water. He then goes back to Nicole and attacks her. He stabbed her in the neck and she started to sort of flail about. Uh, and wasn't dying, so he then stabbed her in the um, Adam's apple, and the knife gets stuck, and he can't get it out. Okay, and how did you kill her? Um, I had to cut her through. He eventually gets it out, and he stabbed her in the heart, and that failed also. And he even describes kicking her, trying to get her to die, and she so eventually dies. I cut her throat first, mm -hmm. and then she. Okay. No one chooses how to die, but their deaths were just horrific in every respect. Not only do they have to see Lauren dying, she has to, you know, it's just a terrible death. In relation to the blood that was on your clothing, can you just show me where the blood was on your clothing, approximately? It was on my sleeves, me, me pants, there's bits of it on my face, on me um, football jumper. He then retrieves the bloody ropes used to tie her to the tree and returns to the car where Camilleri is waiting. You did it. I did it. You killed him. It's done. Good. Let's go. Beckett says that after the murder, he fell asleep as Camilleri drove back into New South Wales, heading for their homes in Yass. They stopped in Canberra on the way to burn their clothes and ropes and to throw their knives into Lake Burley Griffin. The long confession over, Beckett is then driven south and Victorian police are alerted. He is driven over the border and to the Fiddler's Green Creek where he leads the detectives to the girls' bodies. And do you agree that you walked, or we walked together through the bush and uh, just across the creek and slightly upstream, we came to a, uh, an area where there's a large tree falling across the river. Yeah. And beneath the root section of that tree in a portion of water was what appeared to be the remains of a deceased person. Yes. All right. And are you able to tell me now if that was the remains of the girl with the dark hair? Yes. Shane Box is among the police on hand to witness the tragic sight before returning immediately to Bega. He's become very close to the family since the girls disappeared and he weeps as he gives them the terrible news. It's probably the most difficult task a police officer could do would be to look at families of two young girls in the eyes and, and, and tell them that their, their girls were were murdered and that was the last I would ever see of them and, and it was also especially hard for me as a father of two girls to be able to, to do that particular task. Uh, my father pulled me aside uh, and he said that um, they had found uh, Lauren and Nicole's bodies and um, I can't remember. <laughs> I think my body's done a pretty good job of blocking out those, those emotions and feelings and thoughts at the time, but um, I was in a bit of shock, I guess, and that shock stayed with me for many years. They came in their thousands to grieve, filling a small park. The town itself shut down as hearts opened and emotions overflowed. 
Nicole and Lauren were my best friends I've ever had, and now that they've been taken away from me. Do not forget the impact of this terrible tragedy when it comes time for justice to be served. The New South Wales detectives hand all the evidence to the Victorian police, who take carriage of the case under the direction of Detective Inspector Russell Sheether, who prepares the charges of murder. Beckett and Camilleri are extradited to Victoria, but charges of abduction, rape and sexual assault that occurred in New South Wales are held in reserve. Lindsay Beckett pleads guilty to the murders of Lauren and Nicole and is sentenced to two life terms with a non-parole period of 35 years. At the time, it is the longest non-parole period ever handed down in Victoria. Leslie Camilleri protests his innocence, blaming the murders on Beckett. His trial gets underway in February 1999 and lasts 10 weeks, during which more than 180 witnesses are called. Apart from Beckett's testimony, the most damning evidence is a match to Camilleri's DNA in semen on Lauren's clothes found by the roadside at Bega. It, it puts Camilleri not only at the scene, but being involved in sexual activity of which he'd uh, continued and during court continued to deny. There's also shocking testimony from a 19-year-old woman who was raped for hours by Camilleri and Beckett just days before they went to Bega. The star witness is Lindsay Beckett, and he lays bare all the repugnant detail of Lauren and Nicole's ordeal detail which had previously been kept from their families. <laughs> yeah, and your arms. Of how the girls were made to do all sorts of horrible things and, and then you know, obviously as you're hearing what your sister was made to do or, and how she was raped and how she was tortured, um, those thoughts and pictures, images start coming up in your mind. Shut up! Shut up! I am sick of you whining you stupid bitches! and that obviously uh, affects the body and you get quite, quite upset and angry and aggressive and uh, lose control. The long wait for the verdict is also distressing. That, that, that was an extremely tense couple of days because the, the jury took, oh, I think it was nearly 48 hours to give us a result. Leslie Camilleri yawned repeatedly as he was branded a murderer by the jury. When we heard he was guilty, um, I can remember <laughs> my parents um, and Nicole's parents um, yelling, for, like screaming yes and yelling for joy that he, which is hard to, to get some joy, but f from all the stress and pressure we put through, it was uh, you know, a positive in, in, the, in a bad situation. It was um, uh, a ray of light, I guess, that someone was going to be held uh, responsible for uh, the, the girls' murders. Guilty. They were the best words I'd heard in this long long trial. Now maybe our girls can rest in peace and we'd really like to thank the jury. They got it right. It was the culmination of, of at that point, uh, nearly two years of, of investigation and court processes. The trial judge, Mr Justice Vincent, made a dramatic statement at Camilleri's sentencing, which is still remembered years later by the homicide detectives who worked on the case. You've got to kill him. He said, uh, however, I consider that my duty is clear. You are sentenced to imprisonment for life on each count without the possibility of release on parole. Through your actions, you have forfeited your right to walk among us again. The case led to significant reforms because it exposed serious flaws in the New South Wales bail and detention laws. Both killers had extensive criminal records and yet they'd been released on bail just before the murders. 
two years later, Camilleri's appeal is dismissed and he's refused permission to appeal to the High Court. The police receive high praise for their work in tracking down and successfully prosecuting the killers, especially from the people of Bega. People were coming to the front counter just to thank us and sort of give their best wishes, you know. Uh, without the assistance, uh, I believe, of both organisations, which in, or all organisations, which is the New South Wales Police Force, Victoria Police, and also the Australian uh, Federal Police from uh, the ACT, um, this matter would not have been solved. Being involved with the team that I met in Victoria uh, and the exceptional way that they dealt with all of the evidence and, and you know, in some respect, did a more thorough job than I felt I could have done. Uh, the police were amazing, especially uh, Shane Box. They were there, uh, they did everything they possibly could to, to comfort us, and, um, but also sticking with their job at hand, which they have to do. Life in the Bega district returns to normal. It had a big effect on the, on the children's school and also the teachers. Um, but particularly badly affected were the Year 12 students who had, of course, finished up their formal schooling. They've changed people's lives forever. Everybody else who's left behind, everything's changed for them, you know. They have to live with this pain and the heartache for the rest of their life. Hey girls, me. Nothing, there's no excuse. Doesn't matter how you're brought up. <laughs> Have love or hatred or whatever, it's an individual choice. And um, doesn't matter how badly treated you are. <laughs> I think these two were naturally born bad seeds. Uh, they were psychopaths. They got pleasure out of harming others. And they don't belong in our society. Many years later, in jail, Camilleri suddenly confessed to the 1992 murder of Melbourne schoolgirl Prue Bird. Prue was the granddaughter of the police informant who identified the gang that bombed Melbourne's Russell Street Police Headquarters in 1986. The bombers warned Prue's grandmother and her criminal boyfriend that talking to the police would get Prue killed. They talked. And a few years later, Prue was murdered. Camilleri pleaded guilty and says he dumped Prue's body at a tip in suburban Frankston, but can't remember exactly where. Her remains have never been found. Give me closure. I just want to say goodbye in a dignified... She deserves to be buried with dignity and I, I deserve to know. Already locked up for life, Camilleri was sentenced to a further 28 years. He will die in prison. After his curious confession, laws were passed to ensure Camilleri's fellow inmate, the Russell Street bomber Craig Minogue, will also die in jail. <laughs>